This specimen was dissected to show the thoracic inlet, the posterior thoracic wall, the deep muscles of the back, the spinal cord, the lungs and heart removed from this specimen have also been dissected and plastinated. Part of the pericardium has been left in place for better understanding, and you can see the structures at the hilum of the lung. For orientation, note the border of the first rib, the cut edges of the ribs anteriorly, the diaphragm, and these ribs posteriorly. Also note the cut edge of the pericardium. This structure here, little elongated structure with some cartilages, is the right main bronchus. This one here is the right pulmonary artery. And these two here, are the two pulmonary veins, of course, the right ones, going into the left atrium. This is the azygous vein. Note here is the arch of the azygous vein just before it's going to enter the superior vena cava. Lying anterior to the hilum of the lung is the phrenic nerve. At this point, the phrenic nerve is situated between the pleura and the pericardium. Does it supply those structures? What else does it supply? The phrenic nerve supplies the pleura, the pericardium, the peritoneum, and the diaphragm. It is the sole motor supply to the diaphragm, but it also supplies sensory innervation to these other structures, including the diaphragm. On the left side, note the pulmonary artery, the left main bronchus, and the pulmonary veins. These black spots are the hilar lymph nodes. Note that the phrenic nerve goes anterior to the hilum, whereas this nerve right here is the vagus that goes posterior to the hilum of the lung. This is the aorta, the descending aorta, and here is the hemiazygous vein. This structure right here, lying between the azygous and the aorta, is the thoracic duct. The thoracic duct starts from the cisterna chile, and then it terminates by entering at the junction of the left subclavian and the left internal jugular, where they form the left brachiocephalic vein. Now note the neurovascular structures lying in the intercostal spaces. These are posterior intercostal vein, posterior intercostal artery, and the intercostal nerve. How many intercostal nerves do you have? There are 11 pairs of intercostal nerves and one subcostal nerve. Where do these nerves come from? The intercostal nerves are the ventral rami of T1 to T11. The posterior intercostal arteries, majority of them, are branches from the aorta. The upper two posterior intercostal arteries are branches of the costocervical trunk, which comes off the subclavian. The accompanying posterior intercostal veins drain into the azygous vein on the right side and the hemiazygous on the left. And you can see here that the azygous arches over the hilum and then terminates by entering the superior vena cava. I guess you're wondering where the anterior intercostal arteries come from. Well, here 
is the internal thoracic artery, which lies on the inner surface of the sternum. It is a branch of the subclavian, and this internal thoracic artery gives these anterior intercostal arteries. There is an anastomosis along the rib between the branches of the posterior and the anterior intercostal arteries. I'm now running my pointer over the sympathetic trunk or the sympathetic chain. The sympathetic chain extends from the neck to the coccyx. It is connected to these intercostal nerves by way of this bundle of fibers which are called rami communicantes. It's by way of these white rami communicantes that preganglionic fibers enter the sympathetic trunk. The cell bodies of these fibers are located in the thoracic and the upper lumbar segments of the spinal cord. Hence, the sympathetic is called a thoracolumbar outflow. These little swellings on the sympathetic chain are the sympathetic ganglia, the chain ganglia. It is here that some of these preganglionic sympathetic fibers synapse. Having synapsed, some of those fibers return to the intercostal nerves to be distributed along with them to parts of the body, and those tiny connections going from the ganglia to the intercostal nerve are called gray rami communicantes. Each and every single spinal nerve receives a gray ramus communicans. Some of the preganglionic sympathetic fibers leave the sympathetic chain by a bundle of these fibers going towards the midline. These fibers are going to synapse in the prevertebral ganglia like the celiac, and these nerves here, for example, this one I'm pointing to is the greater splanchnic nerve. We are looking at the inferior aspect of the diaphragm. That is the xiphoid process. Here is the vertebral body. This here is the upturned edge of the anterior abdominal wall, same way on this side. Note the diaphragm here. Now you can almost see the light coming through this tendinous part, the central tendon of the diaphragm. This opening in the central tendon is for the inferior vena cava. Can you recall another structure that traverses the same opening? Yes, it is the right phrenic nerve. Right here is the esophageal hiatus through which the esophagus comes into the abdomen. This nerve that is lying along with that traversing the same opening that I'm holding now. This is the anterior vagal trunk. The anterior as well as the posterior vagal trunks traverse the esophageal hiatus. We are looking at the thoracic inlet from above. That is the spine of the vertebra. Note the spinal cord in there. That's the vertebral body. Here is the first rib. This is the clavicle, this being the sternal end of the clavicle. On this side, the clavicle has been removed, so you can see this space where the clavicle articulates with the sternum to form the sternoclavicular joint, the first rib coming along to complete the circle. Lying anterior to the vertebral body, right here where the pointer is, is the esophagus. In front of that here, this big opening, is the trachea. These two muscles here are the strap muscles which are going from the sternum up in the neck. Let us now look at some of these structures related to the first rib. This right here, there's the cut edge of the scalenus anterior. This is where the scalenus anterior is inserted onto the first rib. Lying anterior to the scalenus anterior is this, which is the subclavian vein, 
and lying posterior to it right here is the subclavian artery. Lying next to the subclavian artery over here is the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. Another structure that I would like to point out is the vagus right here as it is situated between the left common carotid and the left internal jugular vein. I would also like to point out some branches of the subclavian artery. This one here is the vertebral artery which traverses the foramen in the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae and this here is the thyrocervical trunk. The other branches would be seen in another specimen. Let us now focus on the spinal cord in C2. In this section, parts of the vertebrae, the spinous processes as well as the laminae have been resected to expose the vertebral canal. Then the dura was cut and removed from this section to expose the spinal cord. These bundles of fibers that you see coming from the posterior aspect of the spinal cord are the dorsal roots of spinal nerves. Do you know the difference between the dorsal root and the dorsal ramus? The dorsal roots are purely sensory whereas the dorsal rami are mixed, that is they contain motor as well as sensory fibers. I suggest you review a typical spinal nerve. Also, can you name a nerve derived from the ventral rami of cervical nerves that goes to supply the diaphragm? The nerve is the phrenic, C3, 4, and 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. Let us now focus our attention on the muscles of the back. The muscles of the back are divided into two groups, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic muscles are the ones which are concerned with movements of the upper limb and respiration. They have all been removed in this specimen. Can you name them? They are trapezius, latissimus dorsi, levator scapulae, rhomboids, and serratus posterior. I suggest you review them in another specimen. The intrinsic muscles are concerned with movements of the spine and maintenance of posture. They fill this space between the uh, spinous processes and the transverse processes of the vertebrae. These are further subdivided into groups and arranged as layers. The group clearly seen here is the erector spiny. This consists of iliocostalis laterally, longissimus in the middle, and spinalis medially. There are only two things that I would like to stress about these muscles. One, that they are all supplied by the dorsal rami of spinal nerves, and two, that they are concerned with movements of spine and maintenance of posture. For further details, if and when you need it, please review it on your own.